This is Coda Radio, episode 440 for November 15th, 2021. Hello, old friends, and welcome back to Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and the business of software development as a world of technology. This episode is brought to you by Cloud Guru with the Cloud Playground, Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud Sandboxes on ACG's credit card, not yours. Get certified, get hired, get learning at cloudguru.com. My name is Chris, and joining us hunkered down from his base of development and shenanigans, it is our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello, Mike. What's up, Chris? Uh oh. You sound a little under the weather. I have to tell you, I am not feeling well. I'm I've I so I've had the Rona before. Yeah. And I am fully vaccinated, so I'm hoping that means it's not the Rona, but I did a home test and it said no. You do have a kid and family. Though they're all vectors of uh, of all kinds of disease, let me tell you. <laughs> well, especially the five year old. My immune system Honestly, if I could like just inject a purple heart into my bloodstream, I, I would. Because this kid comes home. Did you wash your hands, Reese? Yeah. Did you really? Oh, no. Well, go wash your hands. It's like you're asking them to pull nails to wash their damn hands. It's like you're asking them to code in Windows. I mean... I, my kid the other day, I won't say which one. So there's three of them, but I won't say which one. My kid the other day goes... Oh, to see, the- I name names. I mean, you're just like, you're, you're a better dad. The kid comes out of the bathroom... And uh, I say, hey, 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 you didn't wash your hands. Dad, I washed my hands like an hour ago. I'm good. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> Damn kids. You know, uh, maybe you could explain to me why my uh, Twitter feed is blowing up today. Uh, usually when this happens, somebody has bought a new laptop. So I have made many questionable de- decisions in my life. Most of them either involve gin, women, Or frankly, I don't know why I can't get this kid to wash his hands. I'm sorry. This is my hobby (laughs) horse. This is no longer code radio. This is God damn it. Wash your hands. Yeah. So my MacBook Air, my beloved, my sweetheart, my darling. Your M1 MacBook Air. Yes. Is going to a staff member. The Wicked Dave, my CTO. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because his MacBook, not Air, but do you remember the dark days of the regular MacBook? Oh, the butterfly you're talking about? Yeah, she's uh, having some problems. I bet. You bet. Can you guess what those problems are? Uh, the Z key or something. That's what I'm having. My Z key just gave out on the... Yeah, so it, 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 it's it's a Z key and it's a command key that are not working. And that's causing just like all kinds of issues. So like I like Linux. I don't like the fighting. I'll be honest with you. I haven't been happy with the... You're more in the community to speak to this, but I don't like the nastiness, right? I think everybody should get along. And, it's off-putting. Right. It, it, it's mean. It seems, and it's weird because when you when people DM you, and this has been my experience, I can't speak to yours, but when people DM you, they're like not like that, right? They're, oh yeah, well, if you know, Mac OS works for you, it's a cool dog or, you know, oh yeah, if you like, you know, I mean, frankly, people who are true Linux users know I'm talking about the Pop OS stuff, right? So... Yeah, there's been a spat between GNOME and Pop! OS. And and, it, and, it, and I feel like, you know what? It shouldn't happen. And I don't care who's wrong or right. I'm sure, I, know, I know it got covered elsewhere, but I, I think that weakens everybody, honestly. Unnecessary conflicts. And, you know, uh, I am familiar with all of it. I'm familiar with the tweets that, that, you know, supposedly upset the GNOME side and the decisions supposedly upset the Pop! side. And my genuine takeaway from reading everything is that if this conversation had been in person, it would A, have been a total non-issue, and B, probably would, would have been wrapped up in an afternoon. And it's so funny because it's like, you have to read into everything. No, oh, that's exactly what I thought. If this had happened at a conference, if this had happened at Linux Fest Northwest, right? At the at the pub after the, the sessions, it would have been a minute and a half of maybe awkwardness, and then it would have just been resolved. Yeah. And there would have been no issue. Mm-hmm. And, and legitimately, I think a lot of the offense on the GNOME side came from reading into a tweet, perhaps imbuing it with some intention that the author maybe did not intend it to have. And um, it's ex- the exact kind of thing that gets lost in low bandwidth text communication. I mean, I learned my lesson the hard way. Long, long time listeners will know. You don't 
touch anything that's going to start a fight on Twitter because you're always going to be constrained and they're always going to misunderstand you and think that you're being mean. I could see the the individual who tweeted saying I didn't expect them to take it that way. It is one of those things that looking back at it, you can kind of go, oh, I guess I see how they took it that way. Either way, I thought their response was funny. I don't know if you've noticed, but System76 did respond to all of it by just simply making a blog post that just is a super long ass list of all of their upstream open source contributions. And they really had no other comment than that. Obviously, people who listen to this for a long time, I'm friendly with the System76 people. This is all a waste of energy. Yeah. It just is a waste of energy. And frankly, you know, people who can develop Linux desktops, not even applications, but actual like operating systems, are some of the brightest people in the world. And wasting their time on Twitter fights is. And you know what I saw? I saw a lot of, just, I just saw a lot of comments saying, you know, I'm just sick of this. I like, I'm just, I'm leaving Linux or I'm just going to ignore this stuff and just put my head down. And I think really it's just focus on the work. I think that was the message from System76 with that blog post is focus on the work. So it sounds like you're getting yourself a new work system. This is the part where Mike forgot what configuration he ordered. Oh, I got it up right here. Oh, you do? Because Mike's been running a FIFA for a couple hours. <laughs> and, so, and you blew my Twitter up with this. So of course, I've seen it go by. I love it, actually. So yeah. you got a, is, is a it's, called, it's pronounced Pangolin, right? Oh, is it? I thought it was Pangolin. Oh, I, don't I thought know. it was like a like British. Oh, whatever, who cares? I have a hard time with with words, so I'm not the person to ask. I, you went with full disk encryption on the hard drive. You're doing Pop OS 2104 pre-install. I thought that was interesting. But this is where it gets juicy. Wait, why was, why, why was that interesting? I know you have different requirements, especially if you're traveling, but I still am very nervous about encrypting my home disk. I, I'm an old man who had clients who I couldn't recover their data because they lost their... I know, but so even my Mac does have to be encrypted. Right. I know for you, it's a different deal. So do you, do you know what the deal was? I was looking... I mean, is it okay to talk about other brands or are we going to get in trouble <laughs> from potential sponsors? I don't know. You tell me. No, it's fine, of course. I, mean, I know you've been to the Dell headquarters, but I was looking at the XPS. I call it Sputnik. They don't call it that anymore. They call it Developer Edition. So, okay. So there's a crazy story behind this. Okay. Do you want to hear the crazy story? Of course. <laughs> All right. Poor old Mike can't buy servers because reasons right? <laughs> okay. And those reasons are the chip shortage, but Mike is not going to talk politics here. I would direct you to Unfilter Show. <laughs> yeah, I will gripe I will gripe about the supply shortage all you like on that show. <laughs> and also, my whole team is uh, remote now, but I still have my space in Plant City, which is effectively a server farm. Those servers, I regret to inform you, are mostly Thaleos and iMac Pro right now at this point. And very other expensive Apple computers running Linux or running Mac server. Oof. Because the prices on server equipment that I can get from my, I mean, I have a Dell rep and I also called other companies and I'm not trying to pick on Dell. I like Dell. But are like drug dealer insane, right? They're crazy. So I commandeered all the desktops. Everybody who works remote got issued a laptop and I just said, you don't. And I just literally in Slack, I was like, you guys don't have desktops anymore. <laughs> They're the company's property. They're now servers. They're servers now. <laughs> yeah. And then I had a problem because my man, Dave, my CTO, his MacBook, why I bought him two butterfly keyboards in two and a half years is beyond me. They both failed for the same reason. But sure enough, son of a bear, it, it failed. He can't type. So he remapped the keys to get along. But, you know, he prefers to work on Mac. And our policy is you may work on any system you want as long as you don't commit Windows line endings to Git because that is a hanging offense. So I have to give up my M1 Mac Air and I bought a Pangolin from System76. With a Ryzen in it, which is interesting. It's pretty cool. They're all rising. They're all rising. Mm -hmm. So the Pangolin is a pure AMD system. And 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 there is a method to my madness here. Mm. Granted, my fever was 101 when I bought it and talked to the sales guy. So Sam, you did an excellent job here. Why didn't you just get yourself another M1 MacBook Air? Why did you go with a Pangolin Linux box? Yes, yeah, so this is the big thing, right? The Air config versus what I got in the Pangolin does not match up at all. 
Right, 64 gigs of RAM. That's pretty nice. Yeah, 64 gigs of RAM. It's 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 a pretty beastly machine. We have a link on the show notes, I think, definitely in the chat room. Yep. And I want to give it a shot. So you don't know this yet. Confession, I did order also a monitor for it. Ah. A 1080p, because I don't want to fight with Linux upscaling monitor. <laughs> and I have a launch keyboard to go with it. So I, I'm going to be pretty... I'm going to give it another go, the Linux stuff. I think the AM, all AMD with an AMD GPU in there, if this doesn't work for you, I think it's fair to say you gave it a, a really good shot because it's a preloaded Linux box from a Linux first vendor and it's an entire AMD stack with lots of power. Hopefully it works for you. We'll see. Uh, are you going to keep Pop! OS on there? Yeah, yeah, I am. All right, well, you let us know how it is. Also, just a shout out to uh, some friends of ours. They don't sponsor, never have anything like that, no kickback. But if you're looking for a used server, unixsurplus.com. Just going to put that out there. I, I've, that's where I've bought some of my stuff in the past, and uh, I like it. Linode.com slash coder. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support the show. It really makes a difference. Linode.com slash coder. Linode is where we host everything that we've built for the last couple of years, but it's also where I host my personal stuff. It was a Linode weekend. <laughs> it really was. On Friday, I got on my uh, Sync Thing Linode, which is one of the $5 a month boxes, which does Sync Thing and some SSH jump host stuff for me and occasionally other random tasks. Like sometimes I want to have like I want to pull down the stuff I still have in Dropbox and I want to put it on a cloud box. So I, I do like the Dropbox command line version on that box. I could tell it still had some uh, some horsepower to spare because you get a surprising amount of performance out of a $5 a month system. I pulled down um, a Starbound Docker Compose file and, you know, looked pretty good and fired up Starbound on my Linode. So my kids and I have a persistent Starbound world, which is a fun, very, very adorable little game although it lacks controller support on the PC, which is just atrocious. But uh, it it runs great on Linode because it doesn't take a ton of resources for us to play on there. And the system already had, you know, it's pl- I mean, like, I don't I don't need anything more. So, like, I, I think this Linode is going to become, like, my my junk drawer <laughs> server. You know what I mean? Where I just have a bunch of different stuff on there that it just runs great. And then on Sunday, I, I set up a CentOS Stream 8 box because I decided to try out a Docker container of Windows 2000 that you can RDP into, right? I mean, like, how awesome would that be to have a Windows 2000 machine running in a Docker container up on Linode that I can RDP into? Just seems like the ultimate cloud workstation. And what else could you possibly ever want? Uh, And so I thought, well, what a great opportunity to try out CentOS Stream 8 a little bit more. And I did just that, you know? I set it up and I got Docker installed on there. And it's so quick. And... It's such a thrill when you've just done a fresh install on Linode and then you do a system update because the updates download from their local LAN because <laughs> they've cached, you know, they've, they've mirrored the repositories there. And so you just get essentially download speeds that are so fast that the only limitation is how fast your SSH terminal can update the results. <laughs> like, I mean, it's happening faster than the terminal can even update the results. They're just such screamers. And Linode's recently been rolling out NVMe upgraded storage which is awesome. And they have 11 data centers to choose from. So you're going to find something that's close to you that's just a few hops away, either from you or your clients, depending on what you're doing. And, you know, I can sit here and tell you all day long about the various ways we use Linode also for JB. It's critical to our infrastructure now. But I think that $100 will speak for itself. So go there and try it out. So go to linode.com slash coder. Get that $100 and you support the show. It's linode.com slash coder. Get 60-day credit on a new account and support the show. linode.com slash coder so old grumpy developer he's got some questions for us he worries he's becoming the resident old man in his groups he says hey guys long time listener here and i've always appreciated your non-bs response to things happening in the tech world so i'd love your opinion on something that's showing up all over my tech channels these days web three now i'm all for better payments on the web and depending on the application decentralization can be great however It seems that their answer is just throw everything, including code, data, everything into the blockchain. Really? This sounds like a proof of concept, but it's been months. Actually, it's been years. It's been months of talking about how it's going to kill the web as we know it. And yet when you ask people for some solid examples, the answer is just do some, do your research. God, crypto. 
Have I just become the resident old man in these circles shaking my fist at these crazy kids? What's your take? Is Web3 an actual movement and a thing we should be paying attention to or just a niche thing for the crypto bros and shady businesses? And I should mention today, as we are recording, Coinbase, one of the largest online exchanges for crypto, its co-founder and an ex-Sequoia partner announced Paradigm One, which is a $2.5 billion fund that's going to, I guess, essentially VC Web3 companies. And it's $2.5 billion that they're a fund that they're launching today. Also, the Web3 Foundation has a series of grants they've given out to nearly 300 projects. I have information about that in the show notes, including how you could apply for one of these grants. Web3, have you been sucked into any of this hype cycle about Web3 at all? I have been very Clint Eastwood skeptical. So there's a problem in the industry right now where mobile has been dominated by a duopoly of Apple and Google. Agreed. And if you're Facebook, Microsoft, or frankly, anybody else who wants to make money and not give 30% to Apple and Google, you need to manufacture another paradigm. When I hear Web3, I hear Meta. It's the same bullshit. Only Meta is corporate owned by a few giants. And I think a lot of the people behind Web3 envision a blockchain powered, decentralized future utopia. And this, this gets a little nasty because I know you personally know one of those people, or at least someone I'm connected to on LinkedIn who is really, really enthusiastic about it. But it's weird because he made all his money on a very simple, you know, when you come down to it, SaaS service for a niche. Mm, mm -hmm. I don't think that Web3 is a thing. I think it's a marketing term. That's nice. I can't say it all ends in tears because it doesn't, but it's just like a harder way to do simple things, in my opinion. I think it's got a few things going for it, but like all of these things that are this huge thing, I think one or two things will shake out as technologies that people adopt and the other 297 will all disappear and go nowhere. Well, and I will say, like the gentleman I'm thinking of, I believe this gentleman has a lot of power to raise VC money and he will be successful because he has money, right? True. A lot of the stuff I've seen with Web3 is just like tacking on a crypto and the blockchain, the shit that already exists and saying it's Web3. I don't even believe in Web 2.0. <laughs> I'm just like, dude, the DOM existed for a long time. And the only reason the DOM isn't 100% dominant, and I could make a good argument that it is, is because Apple's a little bitch about JavaScript engines on iOS. The problem is that there's one very big platform, very big vendor that has a stake in having the subscription model app development uh, economy continue to work. Today, Roblox announced they're, they're spending a huge amount of money on online education in what they are also calling the metaverse. Don't you think it's interesting you have Web3 and the metaverse happening around the same time, and they're not the same thing? They're the same bloody thing. They're not in one in one key way. In one key way. One is like this utopian, crypto-backed, like we made a bunch of money, and now we want to become... Utopian? Yeah, these people think that... No, they don't. That's the f Yeah, I know, but this is what they're... Let me tell you what they're selling. What they're selling is Web3 is private by default because... All your information is central in a blockchain, so not each company's storing it. Therefore, they're giving up all of the data they collect on you, and you are allowing certain information via controls, and then that information stored in the blockchain. That kind of stuff. I seem to remember somebody telling me that someone else was doing this for open source and Linux, and then all of a sudden, that person sold out. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying I don't buy it. I, I, I don't buy it. They're all shysters. It's all Anybody who can get VC money is in for themselves. I mean, come on, dudes. Web3, define Web3. Is there a new technology? No. Blockchain's been around. It's I think you have two camps. You have people who are delusional and think that companies like Microsoft and Apple and Amazon would give up power and decentralize it to a bunch of uh, you know, to the blockchain. That's never going to happen. And then you have people that actually, you know, know it's never going to happen and are just grifting. I think those are two camps in this group. Okay, I think I have a special experience in this because I'm I'm old enough to have been right there at the beginning of the App Store, right? It was 
a utopia, or so we thought. But it turned out, thank you, Epic, for suing Apple, that it was all from the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> They were using the app store to make bigger deals with other companies and control the ecosystem. Web3 is not... You know what Web3 is? It's somebody who made their money, sold out, everybody over, that wants to now cleanse their reputation. That's what Web3 is. Yeah, and be responsible for building the next generation of some technology platform so they can make their make it into history books. It's not the next generation. You could do the same thing with regular rest. It's putting something on the blockchain does not inherently make it more secure. It doesn't make it better. It in fact makes it slower and dumber. That's dumb. Here's the thing though. Having a decentralized trusted way for companies to share data and do payments, that idea is appealing to a lot of people and that's why I think this Web3 stuff's been picking up momentum since 2018. And it's just been getting, it, the ball has just been bigger. The snowball's just gotten bigger and bigger. I think they're touching on key issues that people are concerned about, like control of privacy. Bull. I, I know, but people care about that. And so they're playing to that. Fry me some bacon. Give me my bacon. Here you go. I have some possum bacon from Tampa. <laughs> Maple possum bacon. It's They're trying to make their rehashed ideas sound like new ideas. It's all Don't listen to it. I was there for the whole mobile boom. I was there when the shysters would sell. They would try to sell Adobe Air to people. Oh, yeah. And saying it was like flat. I mean, it's... These are people who've already made their money yeah. that have no business in this industry. And if we didn't have conflicts, I would go after a very specific person. So it's... If these people weren't rich from either you know selling Bitcoin or uh, cashing out their VC businesses... This Web 3.0 thing wouldn't be going anywhere because it, the industry doesn't necessarily want this, but these people want it. And because they're rich, these people, you, you know, who else is a fraud? Gainer Vaynerchuk, whatever the fuck his name is. Gary. These people, Gary, thank you. These people hustle. And this dude I'm thinking of in particular wants to be the next one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we could talk about this offline because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do know who you're talking about. Yes, I do. <laughs> it's, it's the same. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? We're just going to ignore Web 3 emails because it's nonsense. It's the same. <laughs> Technology hasn't f***ing changed since the 80s. Well, and humans, <laughs> let's be honest, that's at the core of the problem. It's humans. And once you understand human nature and human motivations, and especially once you've had a peek behind the curtain at these industries, you really kind of... Wow, you managed to get another Swift episode out of me. Thank you, Fever. <laughs> Let's do just a couple more emails uh, because we had a couple of spicy ones that are calling Apple out hardcore. And it's a different bend on this story than I think we've taken. So Trev writes in, I just wanted to add my two cents on what I think is Apple's hypocrisy. We're supposed to trust whoever they say we should trust. But then heaven forbid I'm allowed to use my own device the way I want. I'm referring, of course, to the new back door they've opened up for three-letter agencies via iCloud. Bastions of privacy and security, my arse. So Trev says, at the end of the day, you can't trust Apple because the way they've engineered the iCloud backups when you use iCloud messages, it makes it possible for them to get access to things like your messages. And if you use iCloud backup, your backup <laughs> of your phone from the cloud, essentially giving three-letter agencies a backdoor into every iPhone. Uh, I, I just got an iMessage from Fort Meade. They want us to shut the f up right now. <laughs> Daniel is a web dev from Hungary, and he feels like forcing Apple to enable sideloading would actually be a really bad thing. He says, I just cannot agree with the idea that giving the government the power to change some company's software to benefit few, a few people is ever going to be a good thing. Daniel, you are a beautiful man. I have never met you, nor have I seen you, but your spirit... He's from he's from Hungary, but he sounds like a, like a, what are you, what maybe like a, a legacy, a... a American patriot who who's like small government. <laughs> Honestly, he sounds like he's from Utopia. Uh, he says, okay, but here's his argument. If it was okay to force Apple to allow sideloading, then isn't it just the same? Isn't the same logic that Apple should be forced to allow NSA backdoors directly into the phone? Isn't the NSA also working to benefit people? So have you ever heard of phone companies? Yeah, I have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just Daniel, that you you are a beautiful soul. You're deeply confused. But you're a beautiful soul. They, they already do. Everything you've described is already happening. Welcome to the Thunderdome. And it's not just the U.S., by the way. They don't need to build a back door into the phone. What do you mean? They, they, it's already there. It's already there. Once it hits the server, you're done. I think that's just it. We, we, we forget that. <laughs> but it, it matters. 
All right. So I want to say we're going to we're holding on to some productivity tips that have come in this week and we're going to uh, round up of them next week. We've gotten some good ones so far that are like good tips for speeding up people's development workflows. We've had a few ideas for tools that you could add, like to hook up to your machine, actually. Uh, but we'd like more so we can feature them next week. So whatever platform you use, whatever apps you like or tools that have changed your game, let us know. Maybe it's something that's just improved your workspace. Help a fellow coder out. Coder.show slash contact. And then in 411, we'll round some of those up and cover them. We've gotten some good ones in, but I think I, I think maybe we're probably so far going to read three or four on air, so we could use a few more, so that way we could do a nice, complete roundup. Shortcut.com slash coder. Have you really ever been happy with your project management tool? I mean, let's be honest, most are either too simple or they're so complex that you have to essentially have somebody in charge of just prodding everyone to use it all the time. Shortcut, formerly known as Clubhouse, is different because it's worse. No, of course it's not. No, it's, it's way better. Shortcut is a project management tool that's built specifically for software teams. It's fast, it's intuitive, it's flexible, it's powerful, and it has a lot of other nice things going for it. Here's a few of the highlights that I think are great, especially if you have a team that has a team-based workflow. Individual teams can use Shortcut's default workflows or customize them. That's totally optional, too. And they have organizational-wide goals and roadmaps. The work in these workflows is automatically tied into larger company goals. It takes just one click to go from a team roadmap to an individual update and vice versa. And the other thing you have to love is the type VCS integrations. Whether you use GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket, Shortcut ties directly to those so you can update your progress from the command line. Actually, speaking of using the keyboard, it has a very keyboard-friendly interface. And I love this. I think this is a great power user tool. They have what they call the power bar, probably appropriately named, allowing you to do virtually anything without having to touch your mouse. Just throw it away. Just use the keyboard. I think also iteration planning is fantastic. You can set weekly priorities. Oh, man, I could use that. And then let Shortcut run the schedule for you with, you know, a company burn down charts and other kind of reporting that just makes it great. So go give it a try today at shortcut.com slash coder. Again, at shortcut.com slash coder. That's where you go to sign up and support the show. Shortcut.com slash coder. Again, formerly known as Clubhouse. Let's be honest. You shouldn't have to project manage your project management. Shortcut.com slash coder. So developers are really upset this week because it seems like Apple is buying Google ads out from underneath them to redirect users to subscribing via the App Store platform instead of the developer's website, where it would likely be cheaper and they would generate more revenue. <laughs> Apple has just sneaky bought a few ads here and there. A few. To sort of capture search results and send them to the App Store. I don't care who you are. This just doesn't look good. <laughs> well, no, it's not great. And it shows you, I'm going to try to become here, I'm going to, you know, woosai it, that the reality of iOS is that the real business that Apple is in is the business of collecting in-app purchases. Or just, I would say, just monetize the iPhone in general. Right. I, but, but, well, I, but I, I would go a little further. Like, your description was fair, but I, I, I think it was a little uh, diplomatic. They are not saying this is Apple doing it. They're making it look like it's the actual app developer themselves putting up these ads. Wow, really? Yeah. Which they're using the app developers' trademarks, their logos, etc. And the app developers aren't happy, but because it's Apple and no one wants to get kicked off the store. I mean, you can read the article in Forbes. It's a chilling effect. Honestly, Apple is no longer a computer company. They're a middleman company. That's what they are. They're here to collect their tax. They're the IRS of businesses, of, of software businesses. They're here to collect their tax, and that's what they do. And it's a bigger business than the Macintosh business, by the way. So so you're right. Reading the details, they ran the ads for the app as if the developer had ran them. So it'd be like an ad for Overcast on Google Ads. Yeah, Overcast is a small app. Let's take Tinder, which is a hu huge app, because everybody on an app was looking to get some app during the COVID, right? See what I did there? Ah. It's so scummy, right? They pretended to be Tinder. No, I am not a Tinder user anymore. I mean, that's how Chris and I met, but, you know, it's fine. That's a joke. The other part of this is that by buying these ads, they are driving up the cost of legitimate ads from the actual app developer for the name of their own goddamn app. That seems really shady. Honestly, this is the reason... 
not the reason, but this is a reason I bought a Pangolin instead of a Mac today. Because I don't believe that Apple is a, a software company or, frankly, a computer company anymore. They are a revenue maximization company. And, frankly, a middleman company. It really is a shady thing to do because I hadn't thought about... It's super shady. There's no excuse for this. I hadn't thought about it raising the price for developers to advertise their own app. That really is just the worst. Wow. And, you know, they made those uh, first-party app tracking changes. And guess what? Now Apple's ad sales are way up. In fact, uh, Apps Flyer, which is an app marketing survey business, says that really now developers are kind of forced to use Apple's ads if they want to take advantage of any first-party information. So it's no surprise that now the number one player (laughs) in this area is becoming Apple. They've also taken a good chunk out of some of the social networks. Facebook claimed that they were taking a bit of a hit. It seems like it was clearly a motivated move that, geez, it just had the side benefit. I mean, you could you could argue it's for users, but yeah, we said it at the time. This is gonna this is gonna increase their ad sales. What are you talking about? This is gonna increase their in-app purchase revenue. There's no excuse for this. What they decided to do a solid to the biggest grossing apps in their store that were also offering outside of app purchases. Give me a break. I know. This challenges credulity. This is this is why the Mac is honestly so neglected. Yes, the hardware's great, blah, 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 but the software is kind of it doesn't meet the hardware for sure. Yeah, I was thinking like things are good now, right? With uh, things are getting better. Monterey's a pretty good a release as long as you don't change your mouse cursor size. And the M1 hardware and the M1 Macs and Pro updates seem really solid. So do the new MacBooks. They've come back on a few decisions they've made that were awful. And now the MacBooks seem really competitive. But how long will it last? Because this is ultimately, let's say the Mac were to enjoy a it just a renaissance like nobody ever saw. And you know, this is hypothetical, but let's just say it it shoots up to 30% of the PC market, right? Well, what's Apple going to do? They're going to do exactly what they're doing to iPhone users right now. They're going to try to start monetizing the Mac user in every single way because once they reach market saturation of potential customers for their devices because they are very expensive and because they have a very unique ecosystem, Not everyone's going to buy it. So they reach market saturation, and the only direction they have to go then is to monetize all those billions of users. And this is why I'm going back to Linux. (gasps) It's the long-term bet. You're going to have a good time for a short term, is my bet, with the Apple platform. They've got, it's got probably years of interesting growth ahead of it, but it won't last forever. And if you look at the long time scale, you know, Apple's a 30-year plus company. You know, it took them about 20 years, and then they took their eye off the Mac for a bit. And uh, now they're just after 10 years getting back to it. Yeah, but see, I think they really are a services company now. Yeah. They're looking for that sweet, sweet recurring revenue. And you know this because in the background of our conversation has been the chip shortage. Apple is the richest company in the world, or maybe they dropped, I don't know. But they're, you know, they're one of the top three. They could just like, with magic, open factories, right? Because I don't care what you say, if you're willing to throw obscene amounts of money at a problem, those problems get solved. If you think about what this means long term, it's bad for Apple users long term. This is not a good thing to see Apple doing. And if you doubt the seriousness in which Apple sees this, just look at how how serious they are investing in Apple TV and how all in they are with Apple TV. There's only one reason, services. It's services. And that shows you like how far are they willing to go they're willing to become a new HBO. They're willing to basically build HBO inside their company and produce content to, to drive up services. You don't have to deal with any of those nasty labor unions or workers or people who might get hurt on the job building your desktops, right? Seriously, like, yeah. I mean, I know I'm going to put my foot in the fire here, but this is why I have a very sympathetic eye to System76. You know what? They're doing a lot of their work. I know they buy you know, the laptops from overseas and they just re- do whatever they do with them. But they build their Thaleos and some of their other equipment in the U.S., right? The launch keyboard in Denver. They do a fair amount of QA and firmware work. And there's a quite a bit of back and forth with the vendor to just fix small compatibility, niggling issues. Uh, but you're right, they don't build the motherboards or the chassis or anything. But they're getting there, right? They've even said on their roadmap is to get there. Carl and I had a conversation about it when I was there in Denver, and he he's pretty frank about it, really. Like, 
the launch is a step to figuring out how to build an electronic device like this. And it was the baby steps to launching a laptop. It's all in in the end goal to serve building a laptop. I think he'd be pretty pleased if they had something that was getting close to shipping in two years. So that's you know, kind of the timeline we might be looking at. I actually think two, I mean, you might know more than I, I feel two years is... Oh, I think it's optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know. But like they're making the effort. People can listen to old, show, old shows and me rant about Tim Cook when I don't have a fever or when I do, frankly. But I don't like what Apple has become. You know, they were a company started with two buddies out of a garage in California. And they've become this thing that knows neither, you know, state, country, friend. It's all about extracting revenue from other people's labor. And that seems... Apple is a nation onto its own now, really. Right. They're their own country. They, they ta- In fact, they tax as they see fit, which... Right. That's exactly where I was, where I was going. Right. Here's my problem. They are such a relevant player that, A, they come up all the time because of how significant they are in the market, and B, they touch everything. It's like Google, the federal government, Amazon. It's almost impossible to not interface with them in some way. Apple maybe is the one you could get away from the most out of the tech giants, I'd argue. I'm not saying I wouldn't interface with them. I I mean, I'm just saying, do we need to develop for their platforms? I guess I'm feeling a little like we've already reached a dystopia. We just don't realize it's just it. It's dystopia. It's just a boring dystopia because we have this situation where governments and companies and all of this are just unavoidable. And if you have moral objections to how they operate, you have no choice. They, they are such a significant player now that they will still have some influence in your life. And I think that's just a little sad. Sure. But the world has always been hell until somebody said no. Right. The last time somebody said no was Winston Churchill and the people of England. And they said no, and they saved the world. Right. So why can't us as engineers and software developers just say no? I think that's where we should end it. Go ahead. Let me tell you about Web3. No. <laughs> Okay, I'm just kidding. You're right. We should wrap it up there. We have more for next week, but we'll let you go. You got to get rested up and get healthy. Our friends over at Web3 will solve all of the problems for us in the meantime. So I think when we come back, it'll all be solved. <laughs> I have many, <laughs> many doubts. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And of course, you can find Mike on Twitter. He's at Dumanuko. His company's at the Mad Botter Inc. And go check out Alice, his latest project, Alice.dev. I'm at Chris LAS, the whole network, because there's a whole network of shows like Linux Action News and Linux Unplugged at Jupiter Signal, and of course at Coder Radio Show for like announcements, releases, and stuff like this. But you know, you can find links to everything we talked about today at coder.show slash 440. There you'll also find our RSS feed. And last but not least, our contact form. Your feedback, your tips, your questions, your pushback. It's all a really important part of the show. And I'd like to make it even more part of the show. So don't hold back. Coder.show slash contact and let us know. And last but not least, you can interact live on Mondays. We do this show at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. You can get all that at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, and then join us at jblive.tv. Thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of Coda Radio. We'll see you right back here next week.